Today we're going to talk some more about surveying and we're moving on from I guess the more traditional methods of surveying using an auto level like we did last time. And we're going to talk about uh, GPS systems, glo global positioning systems, which is uh, a lot of surveying now is, is performed this way. Even um, smaller government agencies can afford good GPS systems and it really speeds up data acquisition. So they really are becoming very cost effective, uh, a good way to get lots of points much quicker and doing it by hand methods. And we didn't even get into theodolites and total stations, which we also have uh, at Valpo, but those do a really good job, good accurate job, and you can turn angles and you can calculate distances with them using lasers and whatnot uh, for distance measurement. The, but it's still, it's still fairly slow. And GPS is kind of the way uh, a lot of surveying is going. It's not uh, as accurate sometimes, and it can't be used in all places. But it's a, it's a major direction things are moving in. So we're going to talk about that this week in class. And in fact, our lab this week is going to be using GPS systems out in the, in the yard. And to take the place, it'll give you an experience with that compared to the leveling that we did last week All right, from that. the So that's what we're going to cover today. But to get to that point, to, to understand how it works, we're going to talk through the theory behind it. And... Uh, how it's built and and what does our world look like <laughs> in, from a surveying standpoint, I guess, uh, uh, through that. So that's what today's talk is about. Um, so start off with we got some we got some notes uh, I guess to take and to talk about in some terminology. Datum is the first one. A datum in the way surveyors use it is any plane of reference that we want uh, to look at, and typically it's an elevation reference, so it's our Z. Measurement, if X and Y is our horizontal location, then Z is our elevation. And a datum is any horizontal reference. Uh, or sorry, yeah, any reference it is horizontal. Any reference uh, in our in the vertical direction. And so it's an elevation one from it's a horizontal plane right, from that. Or, or nominally, it's a horizontal plane. We're going to find out here in a second. It's not really, but that's that's our idea, right? And and what's our datum? And so we kind of talked about this when we did leveling last week, which is um, you calculated from a benchmark, right? You knew what the elevation of the benchmark was with the light pole, and then you calculated what the elevation was at your instrument. So that's your HI, your height of instrument. And and in some ways, you could say well, you've you've now calculated the datum, a datum and a reference elevation that ran through the center of the optics of your auto levels right, from that. In a more general term, right, a datum is, is a bigger thing, and we have uh, entire datums for the whole U.S. Uh, through that, uh, started from uh, North American datum of 1927, and there was an updated 19, NAD North American datum for 83, and then I think there was another one in 88 or so. And so we we recalculate these datums, these these horizontal reference planes, uh, every now and then, and they hopefully get better over time. Hopefully, we're able to measure things better. And uh, datum maybe a good way to think about it is if you've heard the term, well, how many feet above sea level is it, right? You know, so Denver is the mile high city because one of the steps of the capital is exactly five thousand two hundred eighty feet above sea level. Well. How did they know that? Well, some surveyors went out and they surveyed, apparently, <laughs> from the ocean up, up to it. Well, um, it gets complicated quick, right? You may say, well, they, you know, they uh, ran their shots across the, the Rocky Mountains all the way from the Pacific Ocean, and they calculated what the mean sea level was at, in California, and then they could uh, use auto levels. You could use your levels like we did last week and, and walk a long direction, a long way, and you could carry that level loop all the way up to Denver, right, and figure it out. And the the bad thing with mean sea level, or the main interesting thing with mean sea level, is the Atlantic Ocean has a different mean sea level than the Pacific Ocean does. They are not the same. And so um, that's, uh, well, anyway, I think that's fascinating. Um, so what does mean sea level mean? And, and we talk about, you know, so many feet above sea level, that's a it's more of a layman's term, I guess, for, for our elevation, and that's a datum. So that would be data. If the sea level was true, uh, there was a mean sea level around the entire world, that would be it. Well, it turns out then surveyors like, well, it's not really the same. And if you were to measure the Atlantic versus, versus the Pacific, there's a difference. There's a difference in height elevation. Um, if you uh, read about the Panama Canal, there's... They had to take that into account, that one one ocean is higher than the other one. It's not the same on either side. It's kind of weird, weird stuff. There and so the ellipsoid came to be kind of a generalized version of that, and then we've 
we have to take into account the the pull of gravity and how gravity changes on the face of the the planets and on the earth that's a geoid and so all these things we're going to talk about these as we go through there but that's we're coming back to is if we know what this elevation is in this benchmark you know we know it's 757.15 what's that relative to right what is our base of reference and we reference it to a datum and what is that datum going to be and so these are some of the examples down here we've got mean sea level the upside the geoid here's a north american vertical datum of 88 right that's a pretty common one 83 is a really common one you're going to find out and when we use the gps system this week you're going to see we can set that up well i mean we may not hopefully it's already set in there um, but we can pick that when we start a surveyor we can you can tell it uh, i want a reference to a certain datum and you can pick one of these datums and here in 88 is one of them 83 is one of them and so forth and you also have to pick a geoid and and so forth and so on so that's why we want to learn about it uh, first before we go out in the field is because this is something if you've got a gps a good gps system like a surveyor uses you're gonna it's gonna ask you these questions when you set it up and maybe you're going to probably just Google it to figure out what's the best settings to use or someone's going to tell you, but it, um, uh, hopefully you'll remember a little bit about what the differences are, what, a, what is a geoid, or at least you've heard the term before and you won't look, um, I guess, totally scared when you hear that <laughs> for the first time. Uh, you'll kind of know, hopefully, what the, it is. So what is a geoid? Well, geoid's a global mean sea level model. And so, like I said, the Atlantic is, has a different elevation than the, than the Pacific in most places. Uh, through then, I guess, except at the tip of Argentina. But everywhere else, it's it's a slightly different elevation uh, through there. And it could be feet. It, there's a difference in feet between uh, those elevations. And the this geoid is this model of that. It's a global mean sea level uh, model. And yeah, maybe in the old days when we were just uh, surveying, you know, I guess Virginia was one of the original colonies. Maybe if they were surveying in Virginia, you just go down by the ocean and you pick up the elevation at the ocean there and you work off of that. And uh, maybe that's good enough if you're in a few counties along the coast. But it's not good enough as you get into the, inter the interior of the country or if, let's say, you go to South America or Europe, right? And so we did. they came up with these global models and they call these geoids uh, through that. And here's a, a depiction. You can see what the the geoid looks like over the U.S. and what do those colors mean? The colors mean is that um, because uh, there is higher density, like say in the Rockies, if we go back up to here, you can see these are over here where the Rockies are, and there's a higher density because it's made out of rock versus over here near Indiana. We have lower density because we have softer soils here. It's good for agriculture, but it's, it's lower density. If you've got higher density, right, that gives you a higher gravitational pull. Um, you know, gravity's Pull of gravity is based off of the mass of something versus your mass. And so there's a higher mass, a higher density out here. And so there's actually a higher pull of gravity. Where there's a higher pull of gravity, if, if there were no land masses on the earth and it was just covered in water, the water would be lower here because it's being pulled. Um, uh, there's a greater gravitational pull here where the Rockies are versus here the water would be a little bit higher through that so that's weird and that's what a geoid is and the geoid takes this into account is that the if the earth were completely covered by water if we had water instead of dirt what we're standing on right now um, and there were no live uh, waves or tides uh, through that and then the surface wouldn't be flat and the geoid takes this into account so it's an irregular shape and it takes into account the different gravitational pull uh, where you're at and that's a theoretical water surface. If we were to flood the, the earth and there were no ground left, all right, this is going to be a theoretical water surface. So it's kind of the same idea as mean sea level, but it, it's, um, I guess, brought up to date for the 20th and 21st century. Is it now we realize that, you know, there's, we do have different gravitational pulls right, from that. And ellipsoid, all right, the next one is the earth is not a ball. It's not round. It's actually an ellipsoid. I and mean, it's fatter at the, at the equator. Um, due to the centrifugal force of the Earth's spin. And so the, the Earth bulges out at the equator, and it's fatter. Hold on there. This. And so if we wanted to give kind of a, I guess, a generalized shape, it would be an ellipsoidal shape. It wouldn't be a sphere. And so that's another one. So we look at an, an ellipsoid. And so you can look at this theoretical ellipsoid, which would also... Um, take into account the theoretical level of the earth if you were to average everything out 
through that. And that's our ellipsoid. And if you compare it, like here's the Rocky Mountains here. And we said that the water surface, if it was covered by water, there's more gravitational pull here. And we are going to, our geoid is going to be lower there. The geoid is as if it were covered by water. So that's our geoid. Where the Rocky Mountains are, it's going to be lower. And where they're, where you have less gravitational pull, the water is going to be higher. And then here's our ellipsoid, which is this green line through here. And so that's the difference, right? So the, the ellipsoid would be this theoretical, I guess, nominal um, shape of the planet. And the geoid is going to be different off of that uh, based on the, the pull of gravity. And if it were covered by water right, from that. And if you are standing up here and you've got your GPS system or and you're looking at it, and so our... our our height, if we were to measure off of a geoid, our orthometric height, is going to be based off, is going to be perpendicular to the geoid. And because it's going to try to pull straight down, and if our geoid surface is down here, right, gravity would pull straight in, theoretically, and be perpendicular to the geoid. And so that would be our orthometric height, if we were to measure that. But our ellipsoid at that point would be over here, and you can see, you know, it's not, you know, it's not like, uh, it's not hundreds of feet difference or something like that, or it's not, you know... 12 or 13 degrees difference, right? This, these are fractions of a degree, but it's a big enough difference that in surveying we care. Um, we care about that. So that's our ellipsoidal height. And then <coughs> we have a geoidal height, uh, which is the difference between the geoid and the ellipsoid. And then we have this orthometric, which is uh, perpendicular to the force of gravity. And just, I think the point here is it's complicated, right? It's complicated, and we just want you to, for, our, for 151, right, this is not a real surveying class. This is just a, some background in surveying, so we know what we're doing. So we at least know the terms. Um, when someone says, yeah, well, what's your geoid? What geoid are you using? And you're like, well, at least I've heard what geoid is, and I kind of know it's the theoretical surface of the water. Um, or, you know, what ellipsoidal uh, dimension do we have? All right. Uh, luckily, um, we've got real surveyors who do all this uh, full-time, and they, they have programmed our GPS systems to correct for all these things. If we pick the correct geoid and we pick the correct ellipsoid and the correct datums, and so that's our job is to pick the right ones or at least know uh, what the terms are, and then we can look up what the proper ones to use are each time right, through that. So that's what we're looking at here. That so this geoid is based on the gravitational pull. Ellipsoid is a smooth theoretical body, and our GPS system uh, is working between both of those things and the orthometric uh, height. Uh, to find out what our true position is on the face of the earth in space and time, <laughs> basically, uh, through that. Um, some terms, some more terms, GNS, GNSS is Global Navigation Satellite System, and that's just a general term for any satellite navigation system, and there's multiple ones through there. Now, we typically say GPS here, right? You guys, well, does your phone have GPS? And does your car have GPS? Or you hear that all the time. That was the original one. That was the granddaddy of, of all global navigation satellite systems. But it's technically just the U.S. one. And uh, the U.S. one, it started out as Navstar or something like that. And it became GPS. And uh, and so that's our, our global positioning system. It, they started working on it actually in the 60s, uh, trying to track our... Um, or nuclear-powered submarines. <laughs> Gosh, I just read this. Um, but by the, it became more of a Department of Defense issue because you know, the Department of Defense cares where things are. They need to know, A, started out with where's our, where are our submarines, and then it moved up to the Air Force wanted to know where their planes were. Well, the original systems weren't fast enough to do that, so they started in the 70s, uh, started working hard to make systems that were faster. It ended up with, like, in 73, right, a faster system. Uh, started launching satellites to, to check it out. Um, and the, really the first production satellites started uh, going up in the, in the late 70s and into the 80s. And originally just the military used it. It was only open to the military. And then after uh, a Korean airliner uh, veered, um, made a navigational error and ended up in Russian airspace and got shot down by the uh, USSR in the I think it was late 80s. Uh, through that, uh, they signed a, might have been mid 80s, the, they signed a, an executive, uh, I guess, rule that said that they were going to open up the GPS system to commercial uses. And so that way, particularly, um, uh, jetliners could figure out where they are in the world as they're navigating uh, uh, through time or through uh, across different international boundaries and around the world. I mean, if you can think about how long uh, some of these flights are, you know, 14, 15 hour long flights you know, a little bit of error in your location, you, and you might, 
you might veer off course through that. So, so that's how GPS started becoming commercially available. And originally, the, the, the military had really a more accurate GPS system that wasn't available to commercial systems because I guess the government was worried about um, uh, their unfriendly, <laughs> um, uh, other unfriendly countries using our GPS system to navigate their own uh, department or defense and, and military assets. So, but then that, uh, by 2000, that had been, uh, they'd stopped doing that. And now we get the full uh, high accuracy version of GPS. Everyone can use it uh, through that. And so that's since the early 2000s, we've been able to, to navigate much better with GPS. And hence the pr uh, proliferation of a lot of devices that use GPS, right? It's, and it's started out as like a 35 pound backpack case in the eighties. And it got down now to your, you know, your cell phone or even a little, you know, some little chip. Um, it's always a fraction of a pound and isn't very, you know, an inch by an inch is got enough in it now that it can read satellites and tell you where it's at. You can buy these kits from, from different, uh, electronic suppliers and put them into your own devices. So it's, it's been miniaturized incredibly well and, and fairly accurate for that. There's other systems out there. So GNSS, again, is a, is a general term for any satellite navigation system. Um, China has their own system, Baidu, has 35 satellites, um, came online in 2020, fully operational. The European Union has one, their own, and the Russian Federation does. And your best GPS receivers, oh, I'll call them GPS receivers, but your best re satellite navigation systems will quite often use all of these, all of these uh, constellations. Um, particularly Galileo and GLONASS have been uh, quite popular combined with the U.S. GPS system. And so like our satellite system, uh, our GPS uh, surveying system will use multiple satellites. And so I think it, also, it uses GLONASS as well as the GPS one. Uh, for that. It's actually too old to have Galileo Beto, um, Baidu, or Baidu in it. It's, uh, our system was built in 2008, so uh, neither one of those, those constellations were active yet at that point um, to do that. So there are newer ones that will have that. More satellites is better. All right, we're going to learn that here in a second. How does GPS work? And so the question is, you know, we had this little diagram over here, and we've got the ellipsoids and the geoids and all that. Well, how do we know where we're at? Uh, through that. And so we know it because with multiple satellites, we can triangulate our position. So it's all about going back to triangulating your position right from that. First off, though, we do to know what your elevation is, you have to know what we're referencing it to. You have to know what your ellipsoid is and your geoid is to calculate what your true elevation is. And so, again, you're going to tell your system where you're at uh, through that. For your phone, your phone is going to make some assumptions, whoever you're I guess if you've got a Samsung phone or an Apple phone, they made some assumptions about, well, this is probably the elevation you care about if you're going to use that. But you can download apps and then you can change, uh, you can change your geoid and ellipsoid and, uh, and get different elevations out of that. How does it work? And so it's going to do triangulation. And it's going to triangulate. And so this is an example is if we knew we were out in the western United States and we knew how far we were from Los Angeles, that's our radius three, how far we were from Las Vegas and how far we were from Fresno, California. If we knew what all those uh, uh, radiuses were from that point, um, where those cross is your location. And there's only one point on the surface of the earth. And that's why we need to know the ellipsoid and the geoid. There's only one point on the surface of the earth where all three of those those radiuses, those distances cross and meet. And it's the same thing except in three dimensions over here in this diagram um, from satellites. And so if we have a, if we're standing on the face of the earth and we've got a receiver, we can pick up multiple satellites at once. And each of those satellites, uh, we were able to calculate what are pretty exact distances for each one of those satellites. And again, we're, in this case, the satellite's technically is producing a sphere of distance and where all these multiple spheres that are centered on the satellite where those crosses, that's our location. And so that's what your receiver is doing is your receiver is triangulating um, from multiple satellites, what their, their, their distances it says it are from uh, for each of those satellites. It's triangulating that position it says, well, here you are boop, on the face of the earth and you, it's going to know your X, your Y, and your Z coordinates right, from that. 
And the way, it, I think it's kind of cool, the way it does it is, is these satellites have uh, really accurate atomic clocks built into them, and they are transmitting their exact time. And so they've got the signal that, that beams out from the satellite, and the signal says, um, uh, right now, beep, right now, it is 8.48 uh, universal standard time. And it's much more accurate than that, and down to, you know, uh, ten thousandths of a second or so. And also, oh, by the way, here is my uh, data that tells you where my satellite position is at this, at this exact time. And so your receiver receives that and says, ah, based on the signal I just received, I know what time the signal left the satellite, and I know exactly where that satellite was above the surface of the Earth and what, what orbit it is in. And But I know relative to this, the Earth, I know exactly where that satellite was when it sent this message at X time. And since the, it sent that message, I have received it um, so many milliseconds after it was transmitted. And I know how fast, I know how fast those radio waves travel, right? They travel at the speed of light. And so because I know how many milliseconds have passed since the signal uh, left a known point, I can calculate how far away I am from that known point, and then I can triangulate my position. I know, so that's like if this were the satellite, I know how far away it is, and I know right where it was when it sent that signal, and so I know where my point is relative to it. And so I'm somewhere on this red circle, and then I can pick up other satellites, another satellite, and as long as I have three, theoretically, I can figure out where my position is. So that's how, that's how your GPS receiver is finding your position. Again, it knows where the satellites are and knows how long it took the signal to get to them from a known point. It calculates that distance. And then um, from multiple satellites, it uses that data. And it's basically um, you call a Gaussian uh, error estimate or ellipsoid in there. And so each one's a little bit wrong. And so it's not going to be an exact point, but it's going to be pretty close. And so then we, we can talk about our accuracy then right in the next piece here. Now, knowing that accuracy, right, real basic accuracy, about 16 feet from that. And that's what your phone is giving you. Your phone is giving you probably about 16 foot of accuracy in there. And, I mean, I guess we can test it. <laughs> we can stand over a known point and you can see how close you are. Um, if you can see the GPS receiver we've got, we can see it in real time, and it'll show you what it thinks your location is, and it'll bounce around. And especially your your Z, your uh, elevation, is the least accurate. And that's this point down here. It's the least accurate of the, the of X, Y, and Z of the three coordinates you've got uh, through there, and that and you can see it bounce up and down. So you can see it in real time as it's calculating its elevations off of you know, multiple satellites being received, and that's changing. That's changing constantly uh, as you watch it up and down a few feet uh, through there. The, the things to remember about it are uh, the more satellites we get, the more accurate, more accurate uh, our calculations can be. And so we always want to see more satellites. We want to work as hard as we can uh, to, to see more. And again, on your receivers, your professional grade survey receivers, it'll show you how many satellites it's currently tracking. And you'll see that change too, right, from that. The the one we've got, it won't, it typically won't let you make an, a, a uh, measurement. It won't let you take a, a point uh, on it unless you've got five or six satellites. And so you know, theoretically three is enough, but it doesn't like that. It won't be happy about it uh, if you've only got three on there. So it's going to wait until you get five. In fact, I think it likes eight. Eight, it seems to be this magic number right through there. The survey quality one, which you're going to, you're going to see, right, they can, like your phone is accurate to 16 feet, but a survey good one uh, is going to be down to a few inches. And so that's, that's pretty good. And if we're doing a real tight survey, we're if we were trying to set uh, elevations on like a building floor or something like that, we want to be a little bit better than that. But for a lot of stuff we do, that's really good. And that's going to be plenty good enough, uh, especially for topographic surveying. If you're doing a lot of uh, area, uh, large area calculations, if we were to you know measure fields and go out and get elevations on it, that's going to be really good. And so that's going to be good enough uh, for that. The, the other thing to, to keep in mind is we can do things to make it better, right? And for one is... If you're in an open area and you see more satellites, you're going to do better. You can let your receiver stand in one spot 
uh, for a longer time. In fact, you can get legs for your tripods and set them up and let them sit there for you know, 10 or 15 minutes. And it can take multiple observations from a lot of different satellites because satellites are always moving relative to the face of the Earth or to a point on the Earth. And so if you stay out there longer, you're going to pick up more satellites coming overhead and you can observe them for longer periods of time and you're going to be more accurate. It can recalculate a much more accurate location. So the longer you take a reading, the longer you take a shot, the more accurate it's going to be. So we can do that. Um, and then finally, this last point is what we're going to look at uh, in our lab on Tuesday is going to be we can, if we know a... a a fixed point on the face of the Earth, or a real location, a known point on that location, we can put another GPS receiver on top of it, and we can see uh, how much difference there is from what its GPS location is versus what its real location is on the face of the Earth. And then we can use that as a, uh, a correction factor for our, our mobile one. And there's two ways to, to do this. One is you can get a mobile base station and you can set up a base station over a fixed point. And then you uh, walk around with your, uh, your traveling, I guess, receiver. And they talk to each other via radio and it'll do real-time corrections for you. I think you can call it RTK, uh, real-time correction uh, factors for it. Or there's another way to do that. And we'll talk about it here in a second uh, through that. Why... What, what's, you know, we've got this expensive uh, GPS system and these costs, um, the one we're going to use when it was new is $14,000, right? So that's a, a rough <laughs> value for it. I think they're actually around the same price now, uh, the newer ones. They're better, but, you know, things have improved and, and they have uh, better computational capacity and all that, but the computers get cheaper over time. So um, still in that Fourteen to $20,000 range is about what a, a professional grade GPS system is uh, going to run through there. And yeah, they're worth it. I mean, you can do, do a lot with them uh, through that, especially even working alone. You can get a lot of good points and quickly with it. Right. What's, what gives us errors, interference? Uh, if we're near buildings, we, we back here, right? If we've got uh, if it's a GPS signal, it's a radio signal, and it actually can be reflected off of buildings. And so if it's a reflected signal, right, you think you're in a direct line of sight, this distance from the satellite, but you're actually, it's a further distance. And so that's going to give you error off of that. Sometimes you can't get a signal at all uh, if you're near a big building or trees are bad. So in the summer, when the leaves are out on the trees, it's hard to use GPS in the woods. And you're not going to, it's not going to work well. Uh, through there, and you're not going to get a locked signal. It's better in the winter when the leaves are off, but uh, even then, if you're in a dense enough woods, uh, GPS probably isn't going to work for you. Uh, I've had that problem uh, in different places. And if you get too near a tree sometimes, that's you know, you'll lose your signal from that. If you're from the West Coast, they've got these ceramic uh, dots, I guess, that they glue onto the road to divide the lanes, and so it's like a dotted line on there, they call them uh, bots dots. I think those actually reflect signal and will screw up your GPS. And so car navigation doesn't work <laughs> near as well in like Southern California, where they have these bots dots on the road. Um, so they're in the process of changing those out uh, and getting rid of them because they do interfere with your location off of that. The, uh, like I say, if, if you know a, uh, a point if you've got a, a heavily referenced uh, high accuracy reference network uh, G, uh, benchmark out on the ground that the state surveyor and the local surveyors have all perpetuated and they know the, that exact location, you can set up this base station on top of it and look at what the GPS location is versus that base station and say, oh, well, right now, right at this millisecond, the GPS says it's three inches over here to the side and four inches higher than what I know it really is. And so there's my correction, right? And I can calculate that. And so that's kind of what we're doing. We know these, these known points. We set up a, a real-time base station GPS receiver on top of that. And that is, uh, calc and is, and then you calculate what the satellite position says it is, but that's what the satellite says says it is right at that exact time, but I know it's actually this point. And the difference, where right, I just subtract those those coordinates from each other, I know that's what my correction factor is. If I'm relatively close to that, I can say, well, it's probably the same correction factor over here to my mobile uh, one that I'm walking around the yard with taking my topo shots. And so I'm going to apply that same correction factor 
Um, because it's close enough, it probably has the same interference, the same problems with it, uh, same errors. And I'm going to apply that same correction factor then to the one I'm walking around with. And that's that's what we call uh, a relative uh, system, a relative record system. And that gets us that high accuracy. That gets us down to the inches or sometimes less than an inch uh, correction factors off of that. All right, there's... There's two ways to do it. Site operated, that's a you set up your own base station over a known point. And if you're close to it and it talks to your uh, your mobile system via radio, usually uh, from that, and you can do your own correction factors on your site. If you've got a good base, if you've got a good benchmark nearby that you know the exact location of, you can calculate that. Um, the other way to do it, which I think is easier, and a lot of surveyors use this, is that you can, if there's a permanent uh, network of these base stations of over known points set up, you can just, you can set up a, a link to it and talk to it in real time. And that's what our system does. Our system is using the Indiana um, uh, correction system on what CORE stands for. But anyway, it's, it, I is for Indiana. And so we use the NCORE's uh, permanent network setup system. And you can see on the map here, this is where they have all these permanent stations. And these are recording in real time. And this is these red, uh, circles around them, that's how accurate they think each one of those are at, at any time. And so we are we have good coverage uh, here in Valparaiso. We're between three three or four different of these permanent base stations, and so we're going to get good coverage uh, here. So we're over here uh, in Porter County. We're not too far from the one in Lake County or the one in Gary from that. And a lot of these base stations are set up at NDOT uh, district garages, and so the state owns them and, and maintains them. Right, from that, the the thing is, it's, this is a real time correction, and so to use this system, you have to have an internet connection from our little receiver um, in real time, and it's talking to the server system that's operating these systems, and so it's it's fixing our X, Y, and Z coordinates in real time based off of the correction factors these stations are are generating, and. The, the in-dot system is going to use multiple ones. If I'm here in the middle, it's going to use the correction factors from all three of these and weight them based on how far away I am from them. And so it's going to use multiple of these base stations at once. And so it's a, it's a good system. And again, you don't have to buy a base station. You don't have to operate it and set it up and get the link. All you need is a good internet connection and an account <laughs> from InCourse uh, to run it. Luckily, we have both of those things uh, from that. So that's that's how we get high accuracy. That's how we do our corrections. And you'll, it's also uh, kind of a pain in the rear. We'll drop the internet connection every now and then. You'll it's gonna make this funny little noise on the system we've got, and then you'll know, oh, we lost it, and you'll have to wait until you re you can reconnect um, before you can start taking points again on that. The when you you're ready to collect points, you can uh, collect them based on on these systems in multiple formats and a lot of different coordinates systems. And so you can do it in lat and long. And then again, your elevation though is gonna be based off of some datum that you pick, some geoid that you're gonna pick off there, but you can do it in degrees, minutes and seconds, latitude and longitude, if you want. You can use universal transverse Mercator. And so that's the entire world is split up into these uh, transverse Mercator zones. And we'd be in zone 16. And in the center of that, uh, is some central line, and then you're measuring off of that line, and then also um, off the equator. Up to, and I think it's only accurate up to about 80 degrees north, and 80 degrees south. Do that. So that's UTM coordinates. You may see that now, and then that's one choice you've got. Or you can pick state plane coordinates, and so that's over here. In each state in the U.S. has a state plane coordinate system set up, and they've got some baselines, and you're measuring off of that baseline to where we are. And so in this case. Um, we're at 1 million feet, runs through this line right over here, and then how many feet north of that am I? And so that'll be your, your Y, and then here's your X, and so your X is off of, uh, there's two zones, and so there's a, east, a western zone where this is the western one, here's a darker line is the dividing line, and here's the eastern zone. We'd be in the western zone here, and it's real close to Valparaiso, where this, uh, this center line is, that meridian. It comes off of there, and then you're going to measure over, and it's in feet, and, and so that's you know, you'll be measuring off of that. And so that if you if you're in state plane coordinates, they're really big coordinates, right? You know, we're at, <clears throat> our X is at I don't know five hundred thousand, and our our Y is at you know one point 
four million is is ROI. So they'll be very large, and you'll know them. You're in that. And so those are our choices through that. Quite often we'll plot things. Well, actually, I've seen them plotted in all three things, in all three zones. And it's just and it's there's programs out there that'll convert between all of them. So if you're in one or another, uh, you can always get back to it. So that's what we need to know, right? That's what we need to know. Start using the GPS system. We need to know what our geoid is. We need to know what datum we're going to pick uh, from that and what a datum is. Through that, it's good to know how the satellite systems work. More satellites, the better. The longer we set up and observe a point, and on a point, the better uh, through that. And we have to worry about uh, if our signal is being blocked, either by trees or buildings or some other form of interference near it. Uh, obviously, GPS doesn't work inside, not at all. Survey quality uh, stuff. And then if we have a reference system, if we have a reference network or we have our own base station, we can get really high accuracy. And that's really good for, I would say, well, I used to work in road things. It's really good for anything in roads. It's good enough for any road design project. Um, may not always be good enough uh, for setting the elevations on the, uh, on the bents and the uh, foundations for bridges or something like that, that you might want a little more accurate or buildings, but for any road thing, it's, it's, uh, if you're within a couple inches, you're great and you can do anything. And so we'll, we do use it extensively, um, uh, in our, in the transportation side of things right from that. And then you're going to be able to pick your coordinate system, uh, and you're ready to go. So that's what we're going to be doing in lab this week. Um, we'll be using a GPS system outside. Now you know the background behind all of that.